Welcome to Under the Radar, the show about independent iOS app development. I'm Marco Arment. And I'm David Smith. Under the Radar is never longer than 30 minutes, so let's get started. So we decided to ask our audience on Twitter a little bit ago what we should talk about this week. Because, you know, in the summertime, there's not a whole lot of of news that happens in the tech world usually. Uh, And so we decided this week to do something a little bit different. We're going to have kind of like a lightning round of listener Q&A and basically pick a, a lot of the tweet responses that we got and try to answer them uh, in, you know, because like a lot of these things are not things that we could talk about for a whole episode. Uh, we just don't have enough to say on these issues to fill a half hour, but we might have enough to say on them to fill a few minutes. So we're going to basically pick as many, just see how many we can get through in a half hour and uh, and see what happens from that. So, David, you want to get started? Uh, sure. So the first question that I was going to answer is I got a question from Jordy Bruin, um, who asked about uh, project setup when you are first starting new things. And as somebody who starts a lot of new things a lot, yes, um, I have a lot of experience with this. And I've done a lot of different things. And I think where I'm going to take his question with a lot of these, I'm we're you could be asking a different question than we're actually going to answer. And if that's the case, sorry, but that's um, the way this is just necessarily going to work. So I'm imagining sort of like when you hit new project, what do you, how do you actually set up that initial Xcode project before you start coding? And I've done a lot of things over the years. I've tried all the different templates. Like when you go into Xcode and it has, you know, would you like this to be a tab to application? Would you like it to be a master detail view? There's all kinds of things that you can do. Um, you want to set it up for core data or not, or all of these other sort of templates and this stuff. I've tried all of those in the past. I've always found that at a certain point, it starts to get really messy if I go hit check too many of those boxes. And so at this point, I would say what I do is I just do the smallest one possible. So I do a single view application. I um, don't check any of the core data, even though I use core data, I'll add the, and I'll, I'll go in and add all of those things later. Uh, And I find that works a lot better. So sometimes I'll make a throwaway project to see how the template would have set something up. So if I'm curious if they've changed their core data stack or the way they recommend it, or um, I'll look at it, but I just want it as empty of a project as it can be. And I'll go into my app delegate. I'll create my, you know, instantiate my first, my root view controller and I'll present it. And I find that doing it that way, what I love is I know every every part of the application from the absolute like from from the bottom up is something that I understand and something I know it's working and so that I don't have any of these weird surprises that I find if I set it up using one of their uh, Xcode templates. Cool. Yeah, that's pretty. I have nothing to add to that because I start a new project like every three years, so it, it takes a long time. Uh, I, I always forget what I've done last time, and I just kind of wing it and kind of plow through. Um, your way sounds a lot better than my way. There you go. All right, our next topic uh, comes to us from Shord Janssen, uh, who asks, how do you know when an update is finished and can't be polished anymore? Struggling that with myself now. So this is, you know, this happens to every developer I know, where, like, you have an update or even your 1.0 to your app, and you could just keep making it better and adding a little thing here or there. Oh, you know, I could throw in one more thing. I could throw in one more feature. I could make this thing a little bit better. I could redesign this one screen or this one element. And when do you actually just say, all right, enough is enough, I have to ship it? And for me, I, I've got, I've you know, kind of gone through different parts of this uh, myself and my own experience. Like I've, I've, I've kind of gone a different end of the spectrum here. But ultimately, I think it's better to err on the side of more frequent updates rather than fewer larger updates. Uh, you know, it, it, you can. We, we, we actually talked a little bit about this uh, a while ago and about marketing, where like you can hold back a bunch of features to, to release all at once at, in as like a marketing strategy to try to make like one major update that will be newsworthy enough for maybe some blogs to cover. But in practice, that's not most updates. And the value of that itself is also kind of questionable. Uh, it, it's, it varies as to whether that's even worth doing, whether it actually works that way or not. In general, I, I err now on the side of just release things as they get done. And that tends to work better for me. How about you? Yeah, I would agree that in general, the the thing that I've learned most um, after doing lots of updates is that the things that I think are important or interesting are very often not the things that are important and interesting and so the to, to my users. And so the sooner that I can get it in front of people and get their reactions to it, um, the better. That the number of times I've like, I mean, that I know this, I understand exactly that phase that he's talking about of sort of you're like, oh, what if I did this? What if I did that? What if I did this? And you can keep doing that forever. Like, there is no, you will never reach a point where you're like, done. This is perfect. 
ship it. Um, you have to always be in sort of forcing yourself to cut it off. And I think the more disciplined you can be to bite off small things, get them good and solid, ship them, and get reactions, the better your app will be much more quickly. Um, and sometimes you, you know, when you avoid, probably more importantly, you avoid the situation where you go down this rabbit hole, you build this like crazy new thing that no one uses or isn't important to the app or actually makes the app worse uh, because you're, you're doing it in a way that people aren't actually using your application for. Exactly. So the next one I wanted to react to is a question we got from uh, Rob Farney, who asked um, essentially about the way we do UI layouts. Uh, so do we code them? Do we use Interface Builder or do we use a combination or, you know, in libraries and auto layout and all those kinds of things? And so I, I think I have a slightly strange view on this uh, at least compared to a lot of people. I've never really met someone else who does it the way that I do it, but this just works for the way my brain is. So I do all of my layout uh, in code uh, for the most part. I will do have a few interface builder files. Usually those are for things like setting screens or kind of one-off views that aren't dynamic or interesting. They're just kind of like some, like a little part of the app, you know, a little corner of the application that I don't want to do in code. But usually I'll just write them in code. Um, I do all my layout in um in code as well i don't use auto layout i instead do you know dynamic and interesting layout things but i do it all in like view to layout subviews um or equivalent methods in either the view controller or the view depending on what it is um so every time the a views frame updates i'll go through and update the frames of all of its subviews uh, appropriately um, which is essentially what auto layout does but i do it in a way that for me i can understand that i can be you know right um, clear declarative, you know, code that says like, I want this to be at this percentage of this thing. And I could do that in auto layout and I, maybe I would get some benefits, but every time I've gone down that road of taking my layout code and we're taking my layout and putting it into something else, whether that's interface builder, whether it's auto layout, whenever there's some kind of magic that's happening somewhere else, it, in my experience, it, Comes back, comes back to bite me eventually. That there's, I'm going to be weird edge cases or problems, um, or things that just mean that I would rather just do it in code. Um, it's not for everybody. You have to kind of be good at uh, imagining a, a layout in your brain um, without it, you know, seeing it in front of you. So if you can't do that, then this approach doesn't work. But that's what I do. And a random like pro tip for any kind of UI layout things is that every UI view has a layer and every layer can have a border width. And so one of the like the biggest uh, tools I ever use for fixing and debugging problems with my layouts is taking whatever UI view I'm working with and I say, you know, view.layer.border width equals one, which just adds a little black line around it, um, which makes it incredibly easy to see where things are actually laid out on your screen. Black. That's so boring. You should be using FOF, the the, the bright pink, ugly color that you, that nobody ever uses in reality. So you always know that's what you're looking for. It's true. But then I would need two lines of code rather than just one. <laughs> that's true. All right. Um, yeah, I actually have a pretty similar answer to that question, uh, where I I do occasionally use Interface Builder for something, but it's rare. Uh, I, I I prefer to do things in code. Now, I actually do use auto layout more than just like a, a view will layout subviews kind of thing, where I I will. I will use constraints and constraint in language, but I do it through the library that I that I have open source called Compact Constraint, and it's basically a, a kind of shortcut CSS looking kind of language for declaring a constraints manually. And I use a combination of that along with the um, what's it called the Visual Format language, the kind of ASCII language of constraints, yeah, like the ASCII art thing. I don't know what it's called. Yeah, I believe it's the I think it's called Visual Format language. Anyway. Um, I use a combination of those two things. So basically my layouts end up, you know, there is a, there is a code, there is a function somewhere. Uh, maybe it is view layout subviews or, or awake from neighbor or whatever, you know, there's a view somewhere in my code. There's a section where, where for every view I have listed, like here's all the constraints for when you create this view. And it looks kind of like CSS and it makes it very easy to see what's going on and to change what's going on. And, one of the reasons I do it this way and one of the things I don't really care for about using Interface Builder is when you're using Interface Builder to do things, it's it's often difficult to at a glance see what are all of the what are all of the rules and all of the property changes from default that I'm applying to this object. 
uh, you know, it, it, when interface builder, a lot of times these things are buried in in checkboxes somewhere, or like v- little value changes deep down somewhere that like you might miss if you're glancing gl- uh, glancing at the file. Whereas if you do the layout and and customization of properties all in code, you can see it all right there. You can see everything you're doing to this view or to this window or whatever the case may be. And it makes it a lot easier to find and fix problems and a lot easier to figure out, like, oh, what's going on here? Like, why why is this thing bold or whatever? Like, you can see it all in one place. And that's something that you can just never get, really, in Interface Builder. All right. My next question comes from William Robinson uh, asking, failure? Putting an app out and nobody caring slash downloading. So basically, what happens if your app just doesn't go anywhere? Uh, this is heartbreaking. It happens, though. It happens to everybody. You know, ultimately, what if it starts going somewhere and then stops? And then, you know, eventually sales reach negligible levels. Um, this has happened to a number of my apps because, again, this happens to everybody. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the clearest ones was Bugshot, where it just kind of shot up, you know, made, made a couple thousand dollars in the first few months and then just kind of went down to nothing and was making like a dollar a day for a while uh, at best. And, uh, you know, that's... When that happens, you you, you kind of have to face reality, and it's it's a little hard to to judge. Like, okay, well, if I put a lot more effort into like a two point maybe I can like save this or rescue this. Usually, that's not the right move. Usually, you can't save or rescue it. Usually, the market is telling you something. The market is telling you either, you know, either we don't need this or we are satisfied by other need, by other solutions to this problem enough that yours isn't necessary. Um, and, you, you know, you could change things about it, like, you know, you could change the price maybe. You could, you know, again, you could release a 2.0. But usually if something has failed in the marketplace enough that you need to face this reality, chances are any of those changes you would make to it would not be enough to turn what is clearly a failure into a success. You might eke a little bit more time out of it, a little bit more money out of it, maybe, but probably not. Chances are, you know, recognize your recognize failures early enough and then just move on if you can. Uh, that's usually a better use of the time than, than like, you know, shoving more time and effort into an app that has already failed in the market. Yes, and I've failed a lot. Uh, like the experience he's describing is something that I've experienced many times. I've launched a lot of apps and, and um, I've had many of them that go out and either have the thing you described with Bugshot where it's like it goes up and then just like falls flat or even I've just had it never go anywhere. Um, like you just never know. And the biggest thing I suppose is to understand that it is not like the, the ultimate, the, the, the ultimate product that I am building um, throughout my career is myself. Like what I want is to, at the end of the uh, sort of have each project have everything, if each thing that I build, make me a better developer, make me more able to make better and more awesome, uh, you know, products and, and things down the road. Cause tastes will change. Um, platforms will change. Like all of those things are always going to be very, you know, evolve over time and no one product is going to last forever. You know, my business is based on products in the past that now do kind of terrible, but that was fine. They had their moment. And sometimes, you know, you never are going to know exactly what's going to happen. And so when I, whenever you have failures, I think the most constructive way to look at it is to say, what can I learn from this? How can that, you know, how can this experience have make, make me a better developer and then take that experience and just pour it into your next thing. Um, because as long as you are getting better each time, then you're being successful. Like you are meeting the core goal. And while that's nice when it's, you know, you hit on a product that is successful and really just takes off and like, that's awesome. You know, I'm just really not diminishing that, but making sure that you always keep that perspective that like the individual product is not you, you know, you trying to have some distance from what you create is really helpful and keeping the focus on what can I learn? And now let's go work on the next thing uh, and not get too stuck on it. All right. We are sponsored this week by Braintree. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash radar. Why make payment integration more difficult than it has to be? Braintree's powerful full stack payment platform allows you to accept nearly any type of payment from any device with just one integration. 
It's flexible to your system's needs and supports most programming languages. So whether you're using Java, God, I hope not, you have my sympathy, Java, Ruby, or Python, you always have a range of server-side and client-side SDKs available. The Braintree code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients, and it takes just 10 lines of code to implement. Braintree makes payments and your job a whole lot easier. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash radar. Thanks a lot to Braintree for sponsoring our show. Okay, so uh, the next question I wanted to address is from Hip Tomcat, um, and he's asking uh, about architectural patterns like MVVM, MVC coordinators. Um, had, I've had a few kind of questions about this, like the all of these things do kind of. I don't, I don't go, and maybe my answer will probably uh, point out that I don't go down the road of paying too much attention to, to a lot of these things. Like there's a lot of things that I keep hearing about where people are talking about like new patterns or sometimes there are new structures or approaches to apps or like, and I see that and I look at it and I, I the thing that I always worry about whenever I see people who get really wrapped around um, patterns, and this goes back to like back in my old Java days where the like design patterns thing um, was a big like there was like a big fad where it was that was the whole thing everything had to be a factory or an observer oh god um and the important thing i always try and keep, keep in mind and get in, and like when i get this gonna people ask me this kind of question is making sure that you're writing code that a you can understand um and not that you understand like at a vague level how it works but you can under you understand why it's structured the way it is um like the worst implementations of it whenever I was back when i used to do consulting where i'd come in to a project and um, have to try and work out how they're doing something. And you kind of clearly get the sense that they're using a design pattern because they feel like they should, but they don't really understand what that design pattern's intent or purpose was. And so it's just a mess. So if you're ever going to use a pattern, you have to, it should be this thing that's like, well, I, you know, this is the best way to do it. I completely understand the trade-offs um, on both sides of this. And for me, and the way that I think about this problem, this will work really well. And if one of these approaches works great, having view models or coordinators um, or whatever it is, like if that's, if that fits with the way your brain works, then awesome. That's great. But definitely never feel like you have to go down the road of, of adopting some pattern because it's sort of hip and trendy. Uh, because the nature of hip and trendy is that it will change. And it isn't necessarily changing because we've somehow like had this breakthrough discovery. Um, and now it's like turned the world of software development over time. Like there's an element of it that is just trendy. And so find what works for you and make sure that you can, under, you know, if you can understand your code and it's understandable, you're going to have far fewer bugs um, than the thing where it's like, oh, well, theoretically, if I use this thing and I completely abstract all of my logic away um, down the road, it'll make it easier and I'll have great encapsulation and my bugs will go down because I can, you know, test all my interfaces. And that's great. That's probably true at a certain point, but the actual like developer sitting at the keyboard has to understand what's going on. And if you could can do that then great like for me most of my architectural patterns in my apps i are structured around like singletons and managers i guess i call them like that's the way most of my apps apps all my app logic is kind of broken up into you know i have a whole bunch of singletons that handle a bunch of different like have a, a particular domain so like i have a singleton that handles all my stuff with health and dealing with health kit or dealing with core data or doing networking and for me that works like i can I know we're all like all the problems with that. Like there's certainly issues with singletons and coupling and like, I understand those downsides, but for me it works great and I understand it and I know how not to do it wrong. And so that's what I do. And I try not to be too distracted whenever there's like some hip new thing that's coming out. And, you know, it's like you have the problem of you see a talk, say at a conference or something or a blog post and someone's like, Hey, we did this thing and it worked great for us. And you immediately can, try and ex extend that to say like, hey, they did this cool thing and it will work great for me. When if you really, you have to have a much more deep understanding of what that thing is and what its benefits are but before you can ever make that kind of a judgment. Yeah, I I pretty much agree with everything you said. <laughs> I, I also develop with a lot of singletons and things. Uh, I also don't use a lot of design patterns or at least like i never read the gang of four book and and so maybe i'm using them without even realizing i'm using them uh but i never really got into that side of of software architecture of like really obsessing over that kind of thing uh because in in the scale that i'm typically working at with you know a one person team uh that kind of stuff tends not to matter as much uh as as it would, would maybe on a larger team and i'm working on pretty simple things and also like 
you know, I, I just tend to follow the conventions of the system I'm in. So, like, I'm very familiar with, with the way Apple does things with the Cocoa APIs and the way they're structured and the kind of the, the patterns that they encourage and that they use themselves. And I try to structure the rest of my app that way to, to kind of mesh well and, and kind of mimic the structure of the Cocoa APIs. Uh, beyond that, I don't really do any kind of other fancy structure. All right, uh, next I wanted to bring up a question from Luke Allen, who's asking about the viability and landscape for new indie developers to break into the iOS and Mac marketplace in 2016. Now, this is obviously a big and kind of broad uh, and kind of squishy feelings question. So it's a little hard to answer. Like, you know, can new indies break in now? To me, I, I think all you have to do to answer this question is to take a look at your phone home screen and what apps are on it today. And then think back, or if you if you have old screenshots, even better, look back at what your home what your home screen looked like three years ago, and how many of the apps that you that you're using today were out three years ago. I bet it's not that many. You know that it's, you know ruling out like Apple's built-in apps or anything, which even they have changed quite a bit. Uh, but the fact is that yes, this is a a large and saturated and old market. However, there's always churn in every software market. There's always room for something new. And it isn't always easy to break in, but there's always a spot somewhere in the market. Like, you know, simple things like that you, that you think would be very, very crowded, like notes and weather apps. Like, you know, we bring up these examples a lot. I mean, there's always a market for a new notes or weather app if you can do something a little bit differently. Some people will like yours, some people won't, and that's okay. There's room. It's a very, very big market. Lots of people use it. Not everybody wants the same things out of every app. And a lot of times, people just kind of get tired of what, they've, what they're using and just want to look at something new. So there's always room. It, it, is always, it is getting harder to find that room, and there's more people vying for it. However, there is always room for new things to break into the market. Yes, and, and I think... The key thing when you're, if I, if I was, if, if I was a new indie trying to like sort of, if, if I decided one day that that was what I wanted to do, I want to be an independent software developer, um, I would be very careful about a, like my, check my motivations, make sure I'm doing it for the right reasons and like understand how terrible of a job it is and not just sort of get, <laughs> um, which I can say a bit jokingly, but uh, quite honestly as well, like it is not the, uh, it, it is it is not like a, a glamorous lifestyle being an indie software developer that like there's certainly some upsides of being your own boss and being able to work on things that you think are cool but there's a lot of really not so great things some things that you give up from working for in a corporate job or in a consulting job so you know you there's definitely some trade-offs so make sure you're doing it for the right reason and then making sure that you're yeah have you have realistic expectations about what you are hoping to um, accomplish you know, is it that your goal is to have, in you know, just have a side income from your from your indie work? Is it should, is going to be your entire income? And understand that those different levels are going to require l- different amounts, differing amounts of time and luck and effort. And be careful about what you're going after. You know, like sort of like you said, like some apps, there's a natural uh, trendiness to them, and so it makes sense to get into something and you know be someone that's somewhere anywhere there's a lot is a lot of churn like a weather app is and like sort of comes to mind as something where there's a, there's this natural like i don't know we, everyone just thinks of something differently and so you can have a unique take on something and that has has an opportunity to be successful um and i'd also say be really careful about um taking on projects that are uh very complicated to start with like you either need to be have some if you have some like really deep and interesting new approach to something, like I think of someone like uh, Chris Lissio with all of his audio processing stuff that he does, like he, ha- he has made a business of making software because of a really specific skill set that he has, that he really is good at audio processing. And so he can make a business because not a lot of people can do that. And so if you have a skill like that, like run with that, if you have some background knowledge or some domain expertise, like, Go for that and, and pursue it. Um, and, but if you don't, don't get sucked into the trap of trying to like build this grand big ver- – like it's just like this existing thing but like way bigger and more complicated and better. <laughs> yeah, that never works. Like, like that's going to really come back to bite you, especially if it starts to involve like, oh, it's going to have data syncing and it's going to have all this other stuff. And like that would be 
something I'd stay away from, and especially to start with. Like, start simple. Start with something you under, you enjoy. Something that if you made the app and no one downloaded it, but you had it and could use it every day, that you would be happy. And that's probably a good place to start. All right. The the next question I wanted to uh, address is from Phil Curry, who's asking about unit testing for the one man shop. Is it worthwhile? And if so, where to start? Um, so unit testing is a I would say um, is an academic topic for me as it is something that I have <laughs> never done. Um, so I can speak to it only in the uh, the theoretical rather than in the practical experience um, type. Um, unit testing is something that, well, I have used it in the past, like on different projects, um, but not uh, ne- never on my indie work. And I would say unit testing, f- in my experience, is useful for one of two reasons. It's either useful because the cost of messing something up is very high. Um, So if, you know, if you're someone who's writing software that, you know, is used to control a plane as it's flying through the air, you need some unit testing. Like you need some serious, you know, quality assurance kind of process, because if you mess up that really like like genuinely bad things can happen not just like bad things like my server went down for a few hours like you know life and death kind of situations so if you're if you're in a situation where the cost of of having a having a bug having a mistake is truly you know significant absolutely uh and the other situation where in my experience unit testing is helpful is i know like there are some some developers i've worked with over the years for whom like developer uh, unit testing is the way they think of development that they create, you know, sort of like the test driven development approach of saying like, here's this problem. I'm going to code a test that will, um, you know, be, will, will, will pass once I've solved that problem and then they go and solve the problem. Um, and it's just a, like a, a construct that is helpful for the development process. Um, and if that's helpful for you, then like, you're probably, you know, if you're that kind of person, like I'm not that person, I like, maintaining unit tests is one of the things that it like destroys my soul more than anything else in development (laughs) because I feel like I'm building the app twice and I hate that feeling. I, I, what I value most in my development is being fast and efficient and, um, not doing a lot of ceremony around the development. Like I just want to get into Xcode. I want to, you know, write the codes and ship them and unit testing feels like I'm building two apps and one of them, no one will ever see. So that's my approach to unit testing. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same. I think if I had to write unit tests uh, for everything I did, I would stop programming. <laughs> All right, one very last thing, very quick thing here uh, from Pete, who asked, things you now know that you wish you could have told your younger developer selves when just starting out. So we only have time for maybe one each. So my one is going to be that your actions in your app that you do to your customers are way more important in a competitive landscape than what your competitors are doing. So like if you if your app already has people using it, it is yours you it, like they are yours to lose. People don't usually flee to other apps because of some competitor's feature that attracted them over there. They flee to other apps because your app is sucking in some way. You're neglecting something, you're not addressing something, you're not fixing something, you're being too slow to to adapt something new. Whatever the case may be, your customers are usually yours to lose. And so what you do is way more important than what your competitors do. Absolutely. I think my best advice that I would give my younger self is that nobody has it all together. <laughs> yep. um, and this is most, I guess, to address this sort of like the imposter syndrome kind of a problem that early on in my career, I struggled with a lot. And it's, I still do in some ways, but it's this, it's so easy to look at someone else's output and judge just like judge the output not the process that it took for them to get there um because it's easy to look at the output and say wow look at all like this is perfect it's like you know as though it was somehow like born like it it was birthed magically into the world (laughs) with just this perfect process that was effortless and without problem it's like when the reality is we all make mistakes we all have like the development process is often messy and uncomfortable and we have lots of failures some of those are public some of those are private um but everyone nobody has it all together. We're all just kind of like fumbling our way through. And the the more I was able to wrap my head around that and be comfortable with that reality, uh, I, the more honestly that I was just able to make better software because I was less worried about comparing myself to this impossible standard that I 
imagined other people were living up to and just did my best and that would work that worked out a lot better well said all right thank you very much for listening everybody not bad eight topics in 30 minutes not bad at all it's pretty good yeah all right and we will talk to you next week bye